So this is the beginning of my life, uh, early on at least. I came here on a boat, very similar to that one actually. And from my recollection, it was a lot more crowded. In 1980, we left Cuba uh, trying to get away from communism. 125,000 people left in a very short period, the Mariel boat lifts. And, and that's, that picture is of me uh, just a couple days after I got here. And uh, I can tell you it was, it was traumatic and I was little. You can see how little I was, but I have a pretty good memory in general. But that is etched in my brain. It's, it's tattooed into my brain. And the reason for that is it was a little bit traumatizing, the, the being there at this camp and being yelled at by soldiers and, and being there for a few days without food. We had water and that was it. And the other thing is we got put on these boats. And I remember thinking, why are they yelling at us? Why are they treating us this way? But whatever, we got on the boat and we were in that boat for 12 hours on that trip. Four of that was a very rough rough uh, storm and I still have this ingrained in me and it's when it the boat would go up I saw nothing but sky and when it dropped I saw nothing but four walls of water and that went on for four hours of the 12 that it finally took to get here from the moment we sat down on that boat so that's how I started out that's one of my earlier memories and so what you're going to see today is you pay to go on a roller coaster and you pay for that thrill and excitement I didn't pay but my life's been a roller coaster, and I'm going to show you some of those things. And out of all those bad points where I dropped and I was at what felt like the lowest moment, worst thing of my life, that's really where I learned a lot, and that helped me get to the next level. So one odyssey was going from right here in Cuba, 90 miles to Key West, came here to a, a much different scenario. See, in Cuba, the guys in olive green were yelling at us, and the moment we got into that dock, there were nice volunteers giving us soup and Coca-Cola and chocolate. And my first soldier that I saw was a, a black American soldier who greeted us friendly and helped us on board. What a dichotomy from what I left to what I went to. And we only spent a couple of days in Miami and immediately went 3,000 miles away. So talk about an odyssey for a little kid who just went through this traumatic boat experience. And I'm not a, a drama queen. I'm not saying, oh, it was really it was traumatic for me. My biggest fear is water and the ocean. And so I think that's part of it. So that was one move. But then a few days later, got on my first airplane, never been on an airplane, and went all the way to <sighs> Oakland, California. Grew up right around there. And, and that was tough. It was a different weather. You had to wear a jacket every day, even in the summer. And you had to uh, hear a language that I'd never heard before. Had we stayed in Miami, it would probably have been less traumatizing because the, the language there is Spanish, but even back then. All right. In the fourth grade, I realized something. Other kids had things, and I didn't have any of that. And I wanted some of those things. Um, after school, this is back in the day, so after school, you could, school would end, kids could walk across the street to the shopping center and things like that. And they would do that and go get donuts and go to the liquor store and buy stuff, gum. And I couldn't do any of that because I had a packed lunch from my parents, and that's all I had. And I didn't have any extra money. They didn't give me money for those extra fun things. So I realized something. Out of necessity, I don't know if anybody remembers these cards. I still have a stack of them. I actually have that card. Um, I bought these on a weekend at my grandma's house, just like one little pack. And on Monday, I went to school, and everybody wanted these cards. And I go, oh, wow, let me see. They cost, da, 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 da. maybe they were 10 cents each. I sold them for 25 cents each. And immediately saw, whoa, I just sold out. Next Sunday, we went to my grandma's house again. I went straight to that liquor store and bought a bunch of packs. And Monday I went to school and man, I was onto something. I found something that I really enjoyed because I did not enjoy school. I sucked at school, I got C's and I always felt like a dummy. For starters, I got here, they dropped me in kindergarten uh, three months after getting to the US and I didn't understand one word. So the next year they really made me feel stupid by making me repeat kindergarten and not from the beginning of the year, but about a month in. So here you stand at the first grade line and one day they told me on Monday, you're gonna stand at the kindergarten line. So I was at the, and all the first graders were saying, hey, you're in the wrong line, come over here, come over here. No, no, I, I, I didn't even explain it. I had to do it again. So I always felt stupid in school, very stupid. But I love school because of two things, recess and money. Because I started selling these cards and in one month, I saved up 40 something, $50 of profit in my pocket and I bought Omega Supreme, this transformer toy, which was the biggest transformer robot they had. It cost about $50, and in fourth grade, my parents couldn't afford it, and in fourth grade, I afforded that. That was a huge ego boost for as far as 
hey, I think I can accomplish things. I don't have to depend on anybody. Who cares if I'm bad in school? I have this toy, right? So that was pretty cool. Uh, let's see what's next. So I grew up in right outside of Oakland, California, rough neighborhood, and I didn't have very many great influences around me. I, the most successful guy I knew, we called him Beto. I think his name was Alberto, Roberto, I don't know, but Beto lived right around the corner. We grew up together. He was a few years older than me. And he was successful because he was a major drug dealer. And all the kids in their neighborhood always looked at him like, wow, Beto, did you see the car he bought? Did you see that watch he has? That was what I looked up to because he has money at least, right? And my parents would tell me, go to school, get a good job. You could probably become a school teacher. They make so much money. See, my parents didn't. My parents made a lot less, a lot less than a school teacher. Yet, by the way, I want to point something out. Two years being in the country, they bought their first house. Seven years later, they paid it off, making way less than a school teacher. But they hustled after work, they do other things, and they got ahead. So they were very smart and I learned a lot. Now, you surround yourself with great people and you start becoming better. You surround yourself with bad people and you're going to have problems. I spent the night in jail because I stole shoes from where I worked. I was in high school. I was a senior in high school in a big department store. And I thought, well, I, get, I don't want to sell drugs. I think that's horrible. I don't want to do that. But I want to have things like he has. I want to, and no mentor and no person could tell me, hey, okay, you, you suck at school. There's an alternative. Remember how you used to sell stuff, keep doing that stuff. That, that was so limited. I could sell and I could make a few dollars, but I didn't know you could do more. Right? Because no one ever told me, no one ever mentored me, no one showed me anything. And so I stole a bunch of shoes and I got caught and that just destroyed me. I remember thinking this is, oh, by the way, I was a senior in high school, 17 days before I turned 18. So I was an adult now and it wasn't a slap on the wrist. It was like spend the night in jail, uh, have to go show up to court, uh, put it on your record, pay a fine. I paid out that uh, department store between them, we made an agreement, I paid them all their money. So yeah, now I had this scar on me that I felt like a scarlet letter, like, oh, everybody. Now I really have to go do right. And I really have to go and, um, and prove myself and maybe I'll have to do it on my own. I can't, maybe nobody will hire me ever again, especially when it's that fresh. Now I can say, well, that was 30 years ago. Who cares, right? Um, but back then it was traumatizing. So one of the things I did to make money is I started loaning money in high school to friends. They'd ask me, hey, can you loan me 500 bucks? I'll pay you 550 over the next couple of months. Okay, and I did a bunch of those. And it went pretty well, and I was making a little bit of money. I was also selling chocolates in high school. I'd buy boxes of them. They were 24 cents each when you buy wholesale. And then I'd sell them at school. It's not like here where they melt, it's cold over there. So you take a bag, a clear bag, and you walk with it, and everybody in the hallway stops you. I'd sell three bags a day. I netted $30 every day in my pocket. That was pretty cool. But then uh, someone didn't pay me, a friend from fourth grade, and we're now adults, he didn't pay me. And so I'm telling another friend, that, that friend that I'm telling is the guy I got in trouble with the shoes. And I'm still friends with Jack Keegan at the mo that moment. And I go, hey, Jack, you know, my friend, uh, Noel, he hasn't paid me. He owes me like $300 and he just keeps ignoring me. And he goes, let's get in the car right now. We're gonna go see him. And we drove to his work. I think I was 18 at the time. So this was right after I had just had that problem. And we go over there and uh, go to his work. He goes to his car with a little stick and he breaks his window. And then he runs back to my car and he goes, let's go. I taught him a lesson and we leave. Guess what? I got arrested again. So I had a petty theft and now I had a vandalism charge because I was with him, right? I, I was in the car. Uh, I didn't do it, but it was my, I shouldn't have let that happen. That guy's dead now, Jack Keegan. The one who got me in trouble, who I got in trouble. It was not his fault. I got in trouble with on the shoes and who broke the window. Um, a lot of the guys I went to high school with are dead. And a lot of them are in jail. And a lot of them are probably repeating the cycle of their parents and living in that bad area, not getting ahead in life. All right. I decided that is it. I still have dreams of, of getting in trouble. And so I haven't gotten into trouble. I don't even get a speeding ticket anymore. If you drive with me, you're gonna be bored. Cause I am like, <laughs> I don't wanna get in trouble ever again. So what did I do? I committed to working and I committed to working a lot. I got a job at a radio station in Oakland, California. And I broke the record of a Sunday to a Saturday who worked the most ever in the history. I worked 109 hours. I was 21 and I said, I'm just gonna work. I'm gonna save, I'm gonna get ahead. Um, 
I always had a job. I always had a part-time job. I always had a lot of things going on. And um, I used to go to garage sales through high school and buy stuff and take it to the flea market and see if I can make money that way. Again, not too much direction. I saw my uncle do that, so I kind of copied it. But not seeing an ultimate goal. It was all transactional. I wasn't building anything. I wasn't building relationships. I was just trying to get ahead. And uh, I found a guy selling underwear in his front lawn. And it was jockey brand underwear. And he had jockey tablecloths and jockey flags in a beautiful neighborhood, not where I lived. And I'm like, what is all this? And he says, I'm a sales rep for Jockey International. I'm independent. And I buy all these samples. I go to Vegas. I go to New York. I do trade shows in Macy's, JCPenney. They all buy. And these are my leftovers. I got them here for three bucks. I talked them down to a dollar. And then I said, uh, he, and I thought I could probably sell these for a lot more at the flea market. Talked them to a dollar. We got about 500 of them. And I took it to the flea market and I made about $3,000 total off of that $500 purchase. And I said, oh my God, this is what I need. This is a business, it's legit. This is gonna go well. So did that for a while. And then something amazing happened. I discovered eBay. July of 1999, I opened my first eBay account. And now I wasn't getting $6 for these items anymore. I was getting 15, 14, 12 uh, for items that I was still buying for a dollar. Because to see the guy called me every six months and he'd say, Joel, I've got more samples. Do you want to buy another thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand? And it was going really, really well. It was incredible, actually. That went so well that I said, you know what? I'm, I'm really. Uh, well, no. I, uh, let me go backwards. I wanted to quit my job, but that eBay thing wasn't enough. So I said, let me find. Okay, underwear. Sure, it's underwear, swimwear, whatever things like that. Let me find more of them. And I got fortunate. I'd say lucky, but I did spend an hour a day searching for months. I found a brand out of Mexico that was being sold on eBay. And they were doing phenomenal. They were selling these items on an auction setting, putting very few of them, and selling for $40 for a swimsuit, $50 for a male swimsuit. And I said, I got I to gotta find how I can buy these. I found a distributor in Alabama. He sold them to me for $12.50. And I could sell them for $40, $50. And that went well, except for one thing. I placed the order over the phone. He sends me the products. He charged my card $500. But when I opened the box, it only had about $250 of stuff in there. I called him and I said, hey, what's going on? I didn't get all the stuff. He goes, no, and you're not going to get it either. Very weird. It's like, oh, wow, too bad because this stuff will sell. Then I got desperate. I check on the tags and I see, oh, made in Mexico. Here's the phone number to Mexico. I called the factory, built an amazing relationship with them. I became their importer. It took a while. Right? I started with a $2,500 order over the phone. and we grew it quite a bit. Um, in fact, they had their total sales for the year, the previous year before they met me was 2,500 in the US, but they were in major department stores in Mexico. And the guy said on the phone, the owner said, you know what, you, this is answered prayer. I always dreamed that someone would call me from the US who speaks English and Spanish because they, the idiot I have in Alabama, he, he screws people over, he doesn't speak Spanish, we don't have a great relationship. And I said, that's why I called you. That guy messed it up, but I, I wanted to take it a step further. So built a great relationship. If you've ever read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, this was my rich dad. Both, of, both are named Jose. My dad's Jose. This Jose in Mexico was my rich dad. The guy was really rich and successful. And, and so I got to learn a lot from him. He gave me the idea. He said, hey, I'm selling to you. You're selling on eBay and your website and all that. That's fantastic. But why don't you go take it to trade shows? So remember I was paying the guy in Alabama $12.50 before he ripped me off? I was paying this guy $5 in Mexico directly. But then he said, I'll sell them to you for $4. Take them to trade shows, wholesale them for eight to the stores. And the eights, uh, stores can turn around and sell for 20 or whatever they can. Phenomenal. Oh my God, let's do it. I went to trade shows. I didn't know what I was doing. I put a little booth. I paid $5,000. I started meeting store owners and, and building relationships with them. So remember that $2,500 I bought from him that first call? That grew to over a million dollars a year that I started buying from them. We grew it fast. Uh, it didn't feel fast in the moment. It was very hard work. It was calling. It was working 12 hours a day. But a million dollars a year, I was buying from him. And he loved me, and I loved him, and I wanted to one day buy that brand from him. But something happened. He came and spent 10 days with us here in our house in South Florida with my wife, my kids, and it went phenomenal. It was like a dream come true. I always saw him at the trade shows, never spent personal time at my house with my family. And he went back home and told his son, who hated the dad's business and wanted nothing to do with it, he said, you got to see what Joel's doing over there. You should do some of this stuff. Well, immediately the son started emailing my clients, all those stores I was selling to, 
and telling them, hey, if you want to buy direct, I can help you out. I'm the owner's son, blah, blah, blah. So here I've been building this thing for nine years. That's how long that took me to get it to that. So I was buying it for a million, wholesaling about $2 million of that, doubling my price, making real money. And then I would also start selling retail online. Sometimes I make even more money. And they just pulled it out from under me. Remember I told you at the beginning, my life has been an absolute roller coaster. This was the most depressing day of my life when I realized my dad, my rich dad, he cheated me. He got me to here and look how he just took it all away because blood is thicker than water. And that's what happened. So something happened. That forced me to create my own brand because I realized something. What do I have? Yeah, I own a business. I have an empty shelf. I buy things from this person and I bring them in here and I sell them to that person. I don't own the brand. And I also don't own the final consumer. I don't even know what their email is. I'm selling it to stores and websites and they're making all the money and getting the customer data. If this guy stops selling to me or they stop buying, I'm gone. I got nothing. In me. I've got two, two kids at the time. Now we have four. Two kids at the time, a wife. I'm going to lose everything if they take all this away from me. Not, and it's, it's easy to say that right now. But when you feel that and you think, I'm going to live back in that ghetto that I grew up in where I heard gunshots at night, where I saw helicopters, where you know, I know people got shot and killed. Three guys that I graduated high school are in life in prison that I know. And I go, I'm going to go back to that. I'm going to take my kids back to that. It was very scary. And then I had to go to a barbecue that day when I found all this out. And my wife went, it was a neighbor, and I laid in bed. I just, I couldn't move. And my wife came back and says, hey, Jeff, the owner of the house says, come on, come talk to him. And I said, no, I'm not going. I don't, I, you don't know how I feel right now. She, go, she leaves, comes back. Hey, Jeff says he's not accepting no. Go see him. Just go. He wants to talk to you. He wants to tell you something. Fine. And I go over there. And within 10 minutes, Jeff Jordan uh, gave me my first like real mentoring. And he said something to me. He, he said, those stores you've been selling to, they like you, right? I go, yeah, they like me. I write them handwritten notes. I send them coffee, Starbucks cards. I email them all the time. I take care of them. He goes, they're in love with you, not that product. Why don't you go create your own brand? I don't, I don't know. And so that got me thinking though. Okay. He gave me life. He gave me some life. Um, so I reached out to some really good clients and I said, I need to make my own brand because you saw what's happening. And they really helped me. They sent me samples of my competitors and said, these are our top sellers. Go make a brand that has this idea to it. And I did. And in my first month, that brand whole, uh, retailed 13, a million dollars in the first 13 months. So I had something. Aha. I could do this. And once you have your own brand, guess what? Nobody's taking that away from you. You go on the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, that's yours. That guy who screwed me over is never going to do that to me again, right? I was still buying from him because I had to. Otherwise, the lights would be turned off. But it felt dirty and horrible. Like, I'm buying from him. He's trying to take my business away. But the beautiful thing is that then immediately when that did that, I started a second brand. And once that was picking up, the best email I ever wrote in my life, not disrespectful, not saying anything, I just wrote... Uh, as of this date, I'm not buying any more from you. Just find a new distributor. I'll make the final payment on the last import uh, this date. That gave me such power that I, I didn't have to dispute with them. I just, okay. And I sent them his last $20,000 wire and I was done. And it hurt them. That business went from here to here very quickly and they haven't recovered. And it's been maybe uh, 12, 15 years since then. So it's been a, a 12, 13 years. Yeah. All right. What's next on the roller coaster? So then I realized something. I could keep creating brands. But now that I've got cash and I'm doing okay, I could start buying other people's brands. Here's how it happened. I bought a website out of Tampa. I became great friends with these guys about nine years of going to trade shows and meeting them. And I ended up buying their website. They were doing $300,000 a year on this little website that I was wholesaling to. And I bought it for $90,000 because it was only making about $40,000 a year. I paid them about two times profit. I really worked on that site. I hired good guys that helped me do well. And they were doing 300,000 a year. Our first year, we did 750,000 on it. And our second year, we did a million 50,000 50, on it. Very profitable. About 25 to 30% of that was profit in my pocket. That, uh, allowed, I live a very simple life. That allowed me to go buy all my competitors. Remember that trade show I paid $5,000 and I sat in this little booth? You should have seen all the booths around me. They were phenomenal. All these models and music and a DJ. I bought most of them out. Uh, over the next few years. Then I started, you know, I started in my garage. Well, I started first in a little bedroom with a table and a computer and a little printer. And that's how I was shipping. And I was going to the post office every day, six days a week. But then I got a warehouse. We then later went to a bigger warehouse. This is one of the previous ones. 
But I learned something. Uh, as I started this business, Priority Fulfillment, we did such good shipping and organizing and, and warehousing for people that others started hiring us to do it for them. And then I got involved in a software called Rocket Ship. Uh, I don't know anything about software. But we did create our own software. So I went and found the right person to run it. He exited his business for over $100 million. And I gave him 33% equity right up front. And I said, you be the CEO. And he's running with that. I've dwindled myself down to 10%. But if he exits again for $100 million, I'll gladly take that $10 million. Uh, so I'm rooting for him big time. Um, what has really changed my life in this regard is automating my business and my life. I don't waste time on, on repetitive functions. They're automated. I had six engineers working for me out of India, programming for me and making the business seamless, no shipping errors, no problems. And then I thought, how can I make my life that efficient? Right? Using, if those who know me, I always talk about the calendar, being very organized with your time. I know I'm here today because it's blocked off in my calendar. I know what I'm doing next. I'm never having to think about that stuff. Let me organize myself and be efficient with my time. That has really brought tremendous quality to me. Here's what I, so that underwear company, it ended up owning 21 brands of men's underwear, swimwear, athletic apparel. I just sold it. Uh, I have a small interest in it still, so I'm rooting for those guys that bought it from me and hoping they crush it. Uh, priority fulfillment, I sold that 100%. This all just happened, by the way. That top one happened 60 days ago, that other one 30 days ago. And Rocket Ship, I sold them a majority interest. I only own 10% now in that software company. This is what I do now. I coach, and I found a niche over the last few months, a year maybe, less than a year, and it's coaching guys to become better. I wrote a book with the lessons I've learned in life, and it's called 31 Days to Become a Better Man. Um, and it really is changing life. Some of the guys are here, they can attest that. I also do investments through my own company, Moro Capital. Um, this is me, this is my life. Uh, I spent a lot of time with my family, working out, doing good things, um, being healthy. Now I wanna show a couple, here's the meat and potatoes of, of this presentation. That was just to tell you who I am. But we're gonna wrap it up with some life lessons that I have from my story. You know, people say to dream very big. The problem with dreaming very big is that then you never take action because that sounds so far away. Yeah, I'm going to go build this company and have 100 employees. And then you're, Most people don't get started when it's that big. I like to dream very small for today. My dream by the end of the day is that I make that phone call. So what I got to do, I got to make that phone call and just do that little action. And you'll be surprised how taking those tiny little steps at the end of a year, you're going to get way farther than that person who has this massive dream but doesn't act on it. Nothing wrong with having a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. Go for it but have a lot of little goals. Those are the ones that are really gonna move the needle. So for me, that's what helped me get out of poverty. I didn't say, God, I hope I become a multimillionaire overnight. None of that's gonna happen. But I can make $10 per bar, bar, uh, bag of chocolates, and then I take that money and do a little something else with it, and then a little more, and little by little, you get out of there. Same thing for learning. You're not gonna become a genius overnight, but you could do a lot of audiobooks and reading, uh, healthier, the same thing. Everybody who's unhealthy knows how to get healthy. They just don't do it. But if you take these little tiny steps, like, you know what? I'm sitting on the couch. What am I doing? Let me turn the TV off and let me get up and go do that. And a second part of that is improving the process. I've automated the heck out of my life and my business, and it just takes the thinking out. You develop rules for yourself. You go, nope, that's my rule. That's how I function. You know, my kids don't have to ask me my opinion on a certain thing. They know. It's already established. We've automated that part of it. Um, have an open mind. My God, this changed my life. Um, you know, what do I know about jockey underwear? But I go to a garage, so let me go see, right? My neighbor, Natasha, invited me uh, this last week to be on a, on a call and, and, and this group in Facebook that has like 30,000 followers and to be on a game show of sorts. And I go, all right, what's the alternative? I sit on the couch and watch TV? Yeah, I'll be open-minded and I'll join that organization or go to it and see what happens. And don't close doors. I tell this to my kids every day, especially my boys who are in high school. If you have a girlfriend and you break up with her, you don't have to fight on the way out, just you break up. Don't close doors, don't fight with people. Leave that open. All right, so I didn't dive deep because I'm, for the sake of time, into like the downs that I had, but trust me, this is what it was like. It was ups and downs, and any of those downs could knock you down. Any of those downs, you might wanna end your life. I mean, there could be just tragic consequences to those down moments. When that guy, when the, the thing happened in Mexico, with the distributor, that was a, a serious blow. I thought everything was gone. I was gonna lose what I'd been working 12 hours a day and not living 
I didn't. I didn't go to a movie. I didn't go to a wedding. I didn't go to anything for all these years while I built up this business and it was being taken away from me. But fortunately, and I want to credit Jeff Jordan, who helped me think through that. That got me on a path of mentoring and coaching because that guy changed my life in that moment. He, does, he realizes it. I've, I've told him, and I told him last week, actually. Uh, but he, I don't think he knows the impact it did. Rhonda Byrne is the author of The Secret. That book got me thinking way differently. In fact, when I read it, I was making 50000 a year. Within six, seven years, I was making over a million dollars a year. Not top line sales, my profit in my pocket. I was making over a million dollars a year. And I really credit that book to getting me to think differently. And that's all it is. I was still had the same body. I had the same education. I had the same everything. Just something happened here that got me shifted to a different reality. Number four, control your destiny. Don't be a victim. We live in this victim society where it's cool to say how everybody's treating you bad. When I grew up, it wasn't like that. I wanted to be the hero of the movie. I didn't want to be the... the the guy who loses, um, when I got that backstab of getting that brand taken away from me, which by the way, the brand had a name, a guy's name. And my friends called me that name because they were like, you live this, you breathe it. That was me. And they took it away. Um, well, then I dreamt of, I want to own brands. I want to own the consumers. And I've acquired those 14 businesses to give me that business with a moat around it, around me so that you know I can't have it taken away again. Victimhood is a mindset. You got to get it out. You got to catch yourself early every day. Find where you're feeling sorry for yourself, where you're saying, ah, oh, that's not working. Is this person? Stop it right there and break it down and get out of that way of thinking because it's a downward spiral. All right, here's the last one, I believe. Live below your means. Man, if I would have spent the money I was making when I was making it, I wouldn't have been ready for those lows because they're going to come. There's highs and there's lows, especially as an entrepreneur. Um, I get to enjoy things like bike rides. I went on a bike ride nine years ago. With my, gone on hundreds of bike rides. But nine years ago, when we moved to our community, I went on a bike ride with my kids. It was the middle of summer, middle of the day. And as we're riding through, I took them two blocks down. where There's these beautiful mansions. And my kids see those houses. And I go, I want to show you guys some beautiful houses. And we're, they're seeing them. And they go, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And they're just, each house is more beautiful than the next. And one of my sons stops and he says, why didn't we buy one of these houses? And I said, um, it's the middle of the day, middle of the summer. We've been riding around for about an hour. How many dads have you seen riding around here? They go, no, none. You maybe saw some kids at the park with their moms. You didn't see one dad because all of them are busy paying for those mortgages, for the yacht, for all of that. And I said, and when I explained this all to them in their small minds at the time, they're big boys now, they both said, oh, We'd rather have our house, but have you riding the bike with us. And that's been a common theme. That's the way that I live my life because I don't need all of those things for what? We're finishing up here. So I started by showing you the rough seas that I was in, right? And how, excuse me, one moment while I get something. Ugh. So I don't want to live those rough seas anymore. I don't want to stress at that high level anymore. I haven't stopped. I'm still building businesses. I'm still investing in companies. I'm investing in people and helping them grow uh, in my family. But, but this is what I look for now, tranquility and a calm sea. Um, and it's been working. The last few years have been phenomenal. I don't have the crazy ups and downs. Now I get to help navigate and see it from a different perspective, maybe from a lighthouse to a young entrepreneur. Or I can say, Hey, avoid that. Okay, I went through that. And that's, here's what happened to me. And I experienced share. I don't necessarily have to tell him what to do, but I can share some of that. One of them is a young kid here, Johan. He has a, a, a company, a hauling company called 954 Hauling. I met this kid and I mentored him for a year after I met him because he lives in Weston where I live and he pressure cleaned my driveway. And I was so impressed. He was 16. And in the summer, and he was making thousands of dollars a month doing that. And, uh, 16 years old, showed up with a truck, pressure cleaned, was super polite, and has done a bunch of my friends and other people's. Uh, so I see things like that, and I want to keep helping. Now he has, it's a hauling company moving. He does all of this stuff, and he's 18. So that's what I like. I like finding people who have a, a potential to do more and provide them that guidance that I didn't have, that mentorship that would have avoided some stupidity and some things I regret, right, that I shared a little bit of it. So this is what I do now. I, bought a, I brought a box of books. I'm not going to sell any books. Uh, I'll give them away on one condition. If you go, if you're interested, and some of these guys who are here have done it, you go to joelgandara.com, and I have a 31-day program. This is as salesy as I get, but 
if you want to do it for 31 days, I'm in it every day, super active in it and helping you get through a lot of life challenges. And we drill on some physical components, some mental, emotional, make you a better father, better husband, better member of society. And if you're interested, you sign up for it. It's $199. And if it doesn't work, if you don't get a little bit better in one part of your life, I give you your money back at the end. So far, I started it this year or late last year, 200 and something guys have done it. Nobody's asked for their money back. On the contrary, they've all told me it's changed their life. So if anybody wants to sign up for it, you sign up for it on your phone. You show me, I'll give you a book and I'll sign it. Uh, this is me and this is how you can contact me. That's my website, joelgandara.com. I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, all of that. So I hope that some value has been gotten. I, I, I didn't go as deep on every certain thing, but, but you get a, an idea of the things I've been through and I'm happy to help. I've dedicated my life now. I don't worry about money or working anymore. I worry about giving back and helping people just become better. The reason I focus on men through my program is because I'm a man and that voice, I, I, I notice that I connect a little better. I've coached women entrepreneurs as well, but now this is my niche that I dove into and, and where I find I give the most value to the world. I think it's important to have like a guiding light, a goal, something that reminds you every day of why you're here on this earth. In my book, 31 Days to Become a Better Man, number one is light your fire, that first chapter. It's find your why you're here, right? So every day I walk into my closet and just normal, right? For me, it's emotional moment when I walk into my closet because I get reminded every day why I'm here. And I have the shirt that I came here on the boat with that you saw in the picture. And every single time I walk in, I see that and I go, oh, I'm here for those 15 first cousins that I don't know. And I'm here for that uncle and aunt and my grandparents and everybody who has to have that life, unfortunately, you know, I'm the one, I'm the chosen one. I told myself this story and I believe it and I do it. So every day I'm here to impact lives and to do something better. So I hope everyone can find something physical. It could be a little rock that you put on your windowsill and give it a meaning and have it slap you in the face every single day so that a mundane activity, like walking in your closet, can go like, okay, I got it. I'm going to go do it. Ironically, about a month ago, where I was about 30 days out from selling my company, I go to Costco with my wife and I go, these look good. And you know what? I really don't have that much underwear, right? It's like the, uh, no, I didn't really, I didn't do a good job of that. And then now that, uh, I have a small interest in, I don't even want to tell the, Hey, can I get a discount? I don't even want to tell. So I just went and bought my own underwear for the first time, actually though, in about 20 years. Yes. Yeah. It was ridiculous. I know what it costs to make that stuff. Yeah. So, a lot of young people are starting businesses selling on Amazon where they're either retail arbitrage where they go get it real cheap and put it up there or a brand that's already out there. I think it's important to have your own brand because tomorrow they could take it away like it happened to me. And that's always on my mind when I hear of someone's business. Oh, you're buying these water bottles for a dollar, selling them for two. Great. But what if Crystal Geyser doesn't want to sell to you anymore? And what if the next guy says, I don't need two dollars. I'll get a buck fifty. And you're, it's a race to the bottom. When you create a good brand, the price isn't as important, right? Um, and and then, you know that I'm sure you can help them with like the right color and how to do their logo. Maybe if it's not that, but that, that's part of the package and getting that emotional connection. I think with any brand, what you're doing is you're you're giving an emotion, right? You're selling an emotional feeling to that person. And I say that I'm not a big brand guy. Most of the, I don't even know what brand anything I'm wearing is. Me personally, I'm not a great consumer. Uh, I'm a minimalist, really, but. But there is a brand that the, mo the most successful first person I ever met was a girlfriend that I had, her, her stepfather. And he's got a massive company. That's the first time I met, so met someone wealthy. I was in my early 20s. And I saw his closet and I saw this brand that he loves. And so that became kind of a favorite brand of mine. But why? Because there's mm -hmm. an emotion tied to it. That's the first wealthy guy I ever met. And he was so cool. And he took me to his factory and he showed me, he introduced me to his 200 employees and he knew their names. And I thought he was the thing, right? So there's an emotional connection for me with that brand when I see it and I have some of those shirts. Um, yeah, it's all, you're selling a feeling and there's no price tag to a feeling. If, if that shirt made you so happy when you put it on, I could double the price. You're still going to do it. That's my feeling on, on a brand. The one I just mentioned, uh, Penguin. Oh. Yeah. And here's a beautiful thing. I went to go uh, meet the owner of Perry Ellis, Oscar Feldenkrais. Um, he owns 14 brands or 15 or 12. Uh, and Penguin's one of them. So that was really cool to meet him and spend time with him. And then 
we had a lunch date after that to go have lunch and then COVID hit and I didn't get to, but we did a 30 minute coaching session uh, on that. And yeah, so now I have an even more stronger connection because I know the owner of the brand. There's always, that still happens. You still get those butterflies. The first time that I had to create my own brand of underwear, that starting order that I sent to Columbia, to a factory in Columbia, was $80,000. You better believe I was nervous and I didn't sleep for a few days until they started sending pictures. Look, the production's going. And then I got the samples and okay, it slowly went down. But fortunately for me, it started not with an $80,000 order. The un, the, uh, let's see, the underwear that I had to buy was a $500 order. But I could see people right there at a garage sale buying them for $3. So I go, worst case scenario, I put them in the flea market for three, I'll sell them. That, or worst, what's my worst, worst case scenario? I sold them for a dollar. I bought them for a dollar. I lost 30 bucks for getting the booth and then I'm out of the flea market and I sold them all cheap. You know what was interesting about that? A little side note. When I talked the guy down to a dollar, he said, you know, I have a son about your age. He's inside playing video games. I've told him multiple times, you can have all of this for free. Just stand down here and sell it. You get all this money and he doesn't want it. So I like what you're doing. Yeah, we'll go down to a dollar, right? Uh, so the chocolates, I saw kids buying them in the vending machine. I saw people for sports selling them and people were buying them. So I go, okay, so if I spend $50 on chocolates, let's see what happens, right? Uh, and then going further in that reverse chronological order, uh, the cards was a safe bet. I bought them for myself. I spent 50 cents or whatever on me. Then I saw an opportunity to sell them. So I started very small and then I slowly increased it. Now I've written checks that I can't believe. I've written checks that my parents probably to this day haven't earned that much money in their life. So it, it becomes less stressful. I had a vice president work for me and he said one time, how are you so cool under pressure? And I said, dude, I've been through all this stuff. It's not going to kill me. Right. I have a, I put it on the picture there. I have a, a coach um, who we talk every few months. He's a former Navy SEAL commander. His name's Jocko Willink. And when I first met him, we went to San Diego to his place. He's got this phenomenal big business. And I asked him, wow, this was your first business out of the military? How'd you, weren't you nervous? Weren't you scared? What if this doesn't work out? It's a multi-million dollar deal. And he said, no one can die. Because he's just seen several of his friends get blown up and killed. So when you put it into perspective, you've been through stuff. That's not the end of the world. But sm small bets, are, I think, are better than big ones to start out. Tell them how you connect with Jocko. Yeah, one of those brands that, so Jocko is a podcaster. He owns uh, uh, apparel. He owns, um, he's written like 10 New York Times bestsellers. He's an amazing guy. And I bought a brand. I've been buying underwear brands and I bought a brand called Jocko and they were disappeared. I used to buy from them wholesale and sell it on eBay. And I, one day I go, what happened to Jocko? It's been like 10 years. So I look up and the website's gone and I contact the owner, Michael Lee out of LA. And I say, hey, Michael, what, uh, what's up with the brand? I don't see it anywhere. And he says, oh, I closed it down. I'm done. I go, what do you mean you closed it down? Oh, I'm done. I finished. I'm retired. I go, Look, did you sell it? No. Can I buy it? Yes. And uh, how much? He goes, I don't know. And I said, well, look, you weren't using it. I'll give you $3,000 right now. Sign it over to me and I'll give you 10% of the sales for the first year. He goes, heck yeah. It's better than zero, right? So I did it, but I did it knowing that that brand was going to be hard to re re revive. But I go, it's got Jocko.com that comes with it. I could probably sell it to this guy who wrote one of my favorite books of all time, Extreme Ownership, and let's see what happens. So I immediately sold it to Jocko. Uh, and my conditions were, and if Jamie Cochran wrote me, he's a CEO, she's a CEO of his companies, and said, we don't really need it, but what do you have in mind? Right? He was trying to negotiate all tough. And I wrote back and I said, I want to meet him in person. I want coaching calls with him. Uh, I want uh, a workout and I want $1. And then Jocko wrote me back and he's like, dude, that's amazing. Come fly out with your wife. We'll spend a day together. We'll go to dinner and yeah, I'll coach you. And he threw in tickets for his events and, and all this stuff. So I got to build a relationship and have a world-class coach for a dollar. Uh, but now he told me we we're in his podcast studio for like three hours one day. And he said, you know that I would have probably given you like 300,000 for that website, right? He wanted to test me, and I said, I don't care. I don't need the money, and this is so much more worth it. So uh, it, it's, it's still till this day, I think it is. Yeah. If you don't know Jocko, uh, he's up there. I mean, him and David Goggins are mm -hmm. two of the most motivational, inspirational former Navy SEALs that have done amazing things and written amazing books. I quoted David Goggins a lot in my book, but Jocko is just as accomplished. I appreciate you sharing. If you like this event, you like this inspiration, this community, this connection, this space, NSU, what Jim mentioned, what, what's going on here. This is, you know, in the community. It's a free event. There's no catch. 
no cult, there's no, you know, anything like that. Um, follow us at Choose 954, keep you in the know what's going on. We do this every second Friday morning of the month for free. If you like accountability, goal setting, masterminding, we recently revived uh, a goal setting accountability mini mastermind group with my dear friend Eden Nolasco there called Action Club, A-X-E-N, Action and Zen. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to do in the world. Uh, come in with a goal, idea, startup, passion project, or none of those things. And literally the brain trust and the power of the room help you innovate and accelerate those ideas for free. And neutral third party strangers end up becoming your friends, supporters, collaborators, business partners. Uh, brought so many beautiful ideas to life, uh, including Enid shared raw storytelling. That's every other Tuesday uh, it, at Art in Oakland Park. Um, have a really great annual event coming up tomorrow. The sixth annual Female Brew Fest that my business partner's wife started as a craft beer lover and a women's empowerment uh, advocate. They started the pioneering craft beer festival to highlight women in the craft brewing industry, brewery owners, brew mistresses, brew masters. Um, it's going to take place at Esplanade Park tomorrow, 12 to 5. And um, it's a great event, 40 plus breweries from all around the Country, some of the best in the world are coming here. Choose 954 in Fort Lauderdale. Um, we got a whole bunch of other great events. We still host free tours at Art Walk every third Saturday in downtown Hollywood. Beautiful event, beautiful Art Walk if you've never been. Jim's event that he mentioned on Sunday. Okay. And real quick um, about the Ruben Stacy, I'll just mention, uh, give you guys a quick preview heads up. We're bringing back what's going to be now the sixth annual Fort Lauderdale Artist Design Week. And we had a connection to the Ruben Stacy story that we never could have anticipated by creating a countywide platform to allow and support people to host events within the art and design realm. And one of these events took place on Sistrunk. Um, it was called the Sistrunk Affair. It's part of uh, Broward uh, Art and Weekend. And um, an artist discovered a photo of Ruben Stacy. And um, Shared, and it was in the Smithsonian, it's a world famous photo, and shared it with her mother, and her mother said, that's your uncle? And um, yeah. Katie Swatowski from WLRN, from our local NPR, wrote a story about it, and ended up winning like a Smithsonian award uh, for this painting recreation of uh, this famous lynching that she didn't know was part of her family history, local history, and that's what happens when you participate in events, you come out, when you engage with the community, you so needless to say, there's cool stuff happening in the community. I'm an open book, Joel's an open book, my business partner's an open book, his baby's an open book as well. So we're writing the story up. Um, always an open book. Uh, I do encourage you September the 15th uh, at David's, uh, David's Beautiful Space up in Delray. It's going to be a beautiful breathwork, yoga, meditation, flute, sound bath event. If you've never done any of that, you're in for a treat. Um, we have a discount code we could, we could offer for attending. Uh, so feel free to connect with us. And last thing, very quickly. Um, you talked a little bit about a book I heard about called Learning. If you like this stuff and you find any of what we're doing in interesting or impactful, I recently published my first book called Learning to Choose, Not Just My Story. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Learning Lessons I acquired on my early entrepreneurial journey. Me and Andrew, uh, it wasn't easy for us, a lot of highs and lows as well. And um, just a friendly reminder that anything is possible. Never could imagine when I set out with my cell phone to cover local artists that we'd be opening art studios in former Burberry stores next to Louis Vuittons and other states. We've now been 29 of these formerly vacant spaces with the support of over 400 artists over the last four years. And now we're taking this thing global. Um, so anything is possible. I appreciate you mentioning that. Joel's book is great as well. I'm excited to join us in the last thing closing. We'll hang around, we can chat, um, meet Joel, take a picture, but we're gonna take one group selfie that's a selfie speaker.